or get to know where does my audiences came from. So you could type uh, your origins, I mean, the nations or the country provinces that you currently from to the chat column down below so that I could see um, our audiences uh, in this webinar about humanitarian values in preschool educa educations. We've got Sweden. Hi, Ingrid. I do hope that you're great. And thank you very much for making the time to be here. Okay, we have Pamela from Ecuador. Hi, Pamela. I do hope that everything's going great there. I do hope that everybody's healthy. And we also have uh, Christian Simpson from Canada. Hi. And then we have Greece, Athens. Wow, amazing. We are literally bringing the whole world together today. So it is uh, very great uh, to have everybody here because today we are going to talk about the importance of humanitarian values and um, how to teach uh, those uh, virtues to our children, especially those who are still in the preschool education. So we are going to listen to three uh, distinguished speakers from OMAP. And uh, without any further ado, uh, let's just start our uh, forum for today. And hello, France and New York. Thank you very much for joining us. And I believe there are going to be a lot more audiences to come. So uh, good evening from Indonesia, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and good morning. I do really hope that everybody is doing great, healthy, safe and sound. And welcome to the webinar, Humanitarian Values in Preschool Education by Mercedes Mayo Lasalle with Jessica Esri and Mie Oba, where we are going to talk about the importance of teaching humanitarian values such as humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, voluntary service, unity, as well as universality. Uh, these seven fundamental principles are vital in helping people in need during conflicts, natural disasters, and other emergencies. We do believe that education will help us develop a new paradigm in society with no discrimination and inequality because education is the key to change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this forum is a collaboration event be between OMAP and Ed Heroes. I believe most of you have heard about both organizations, but please allow me to explain once more. OMAP, uh, the name of organization is came from Organisation Mondiale pour l'Education Préscolaire, pardon my French, I'm trying my best, <laughs> or the acronym OMAP. The name can be translated into English as the World Organization for Early Childhood Education, but always a setting before the acronym OMAP. OMAP is an international, non-governmental and non-profit organization which has worked for all aspects of early childhood education and care or ECIC since 1948. OMAP is currently in over 70 countries, has special consultative status in the United Nations, UNESCO and ECOSOC and is represented at the meeting of other organization with similar aims. OMAP defends and promotes the rights of the child to education and care worldwide and supports activities which improve accessibility to high quality education and care. And now I would like to explain about Ed Heroes. Ed Heroes is a movement that unites people who believe that education should be centered on the needs of the family. Our mission is to provide support to families all over the world in their journey to success and prosperity by giving them access to a quality education. At the same time, the family's main goal is to bring up an autonomous, capable and happy individual. Due to the pandemic and the forced transition to distance learning for everyone connected with education, we have had to deal with some unprecedented challenges. I believe uh, we all here have currently endured that and the family has become, become the main platform 
for educating and bringing up a child, the Ed Heroes movement emerged in response to global uncertainty. It embodies the idea that education should be centered around the interests of the family. Ed Heroes is currently expanding to Asia, where we started the movement in Indonesia last year and just had our launching in Malaysia. And I am humbled to be the project chairwoman of Ed Heroes Asia. And with the shared and the similar values and visions, we decided to do a collaboration and hope that we could implement the knowledge gained from our distinguished speakers on our daily basis. We would like to welcome uh, Mercedes Mayo Lasalle as the world president of OMEP, Ms. Jessica N. Essary, PhD, as the OMEP representative in the UN and Ms. Mie Oba as the OMEP Japan representative. I personally cannot wait for it, and I believe you do too. Therefore, without any further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker for today, Ms. Mercedes Mayo Lasalle as the world president of OMEP. Ms. Mercedes Mayo Lasalle has a degree in primary education with a Bachelor of Arts in Educational Sciences from the University of Buenos Aires in the area of government, ex-director of the early childhood education area of the city of Buenos Aires. She is also a, an ex-senior consultant for the United Nations Development Program. Nowadays, uh, she is a professor in the Master Early Childhood Education at the University of Buenos Aires and the Regional Training Program in Educational Policy Planning and Management, IAPE UNESCO, Buenos Aires, Ovis for Latin America. Her field of interest is early childhood education policies in relation to children's rights and management of educational institutions for children aged zero to three years. She coordinates training and teacher update programs in poverty context and assess public policies and program on early childhood education and care. We would like to announce to the audience if you have any questions you could address it to our email at hello at, at heroes.asia and we will upload the answers on social media. Without any further ado, Ms. Mercedes, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this online discussion about humanitarian values in Bruce preschool education. Today, three colleagues from OMEP, the World Organization for Early Childhood Education, Jessica Sari, Mieova, and me, educators and researchers from different countries of the planet, will present and share our ideas about early childhood education and care and humanitarian values. As I said, we all are members of OMEP. Since its creation in 1948, OMEP is collaborating in the construction of a fair and human world, aiming a holistic development of early childhood. OMEP focuses on education because we believe that it is a right, but also a tool for the realization of all human rights and it is a catalyzer of, for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Since OMEP founding, one of our main aims is to collaborate in building cultures of peace, which has been at the center of all projects and actions. The longing of peace is rooted in the hearts of all men, said Alba Mirdal, first president of OMEP, who won the Nobel Prize, a uh, Nobel Peace Prize on 1982 due to her outstanding work for peace and disarmament. To promote fair, peaceful and inclusive societies, we need to build cultures of peace. Humanity also needs the determination and solidarity of the communities and states of all the world. As you all know, humanity has committed itself through the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development 
to end poverty, inequalities, environmental depredations, war, famines, inequities and discrimination. Undoubtedly, to build the world we dream, our first duty is to care and to educate children, assuring their human rights from birth. But this struggle is not new since it has gone through different milestones since the beginning of the 20th century and perhaps before if we consider the development of pedagogical knowledge since Pestalozzi and Freire. OMEP's work is based in two political pillars, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the 2030 Agenda. These two great tools for the transformation of our societies are permeant by the highest humanitarian values. The CRC is based on the principles proclaimed in the chapter, Charter sorry, of the human, uh, United Nations, freedom, justice, peace in the world, which are based in the recognition of the intrinsic dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. That is why it is considered fundamental to each child that each child should be fully prepared to live an individual life in society and brought up in the spirit of ideals proclaimed in the Charter of the United Nations and in particular in the spirit of peace, dignity, tolerance, freedom, equality and solidarity. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by all the United Nations member states in 2015 provides also a sheer blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet, now and into the future. And at its heart are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are the urgent call for action by all countries in the Global Partnership. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivation must go hand by hand with strategies that improve health, education, reduce inequalities, spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. Heads of states, governments and high representatives resolved to end poverty and hungry, hunger everywhere, to combat inequalities within and among countries, to build peaceful, fair and inclusive societies, to protect human rights and to promote gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, and to ensure the lasting protection of the planet at, and its natural resources. Undoubtedly, in these decisions and intention, all humanitarian values are present. If we focus SDG 4 of, of education, the global commitment to education focuses on the task of achieving inclusive, equitable, and quality education for all. Consequently, Target 4.7 declares that by 2030, the state must ensure all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity. Sustainable development cannot be realized without peace and security, and peace and security will be at risk without sustainable development. As you can see, 
the 2030 Agenda pledge to foster intercultural understanding, tolerance, mutual respect, and an ethic of global citizenship and shared responsibilities while acknowledging the natural and cultural diversity of the world and recognizing that all cultures and all civilization can contribute to and are crucial enables of sustainable development. So, one of the aims of education is the construction of citizenship, which will imply the development of a pedagogy based on values and respectful of human rights from the first years of life. This paradigm is the result of many struggles, debates, and demands over the last 50 years at least. In 1985, UNESCO published the book Seeds for Peace, the role of preschool education in international understanding and education for peace. It was written by Madame Madeleine Goutard, president of OMEP, and was supported by a consultation team composed by, of humanists and pedagogues from Hungary, Lebanon, Colombia, Portugal, Belgium, Togo, and France. It is interesting to revisit its proposal and the validity of the message. For example, this, writing a work on preschool education for peace is therefore not a matter of describing a specific subject to be taught to very young children. It means helping parents and teachers to become aware that their own deep-seated attitudes towards life and death and showing them that the way they relate to others and to children in particular, is an important factor contributing to peace or violence. It means pointing out ways in which they may act positively and with greater awareness as agents of peace, capable of fostering peace at home and at work, and thereby passing on to the very young, the essential ability needed to find peace within themselves and with those around them. Very young children can have no linking of what peace or war means, nor have they any knowledge of the world situation. They are nevertheless capable of sensing inside themselves feelings of peace or conflict, depending on the kind of life they lead in the family, at the nursery or preschool, or in the surrounding community. Currently, and for the last 12 years at OMEP, we have been committed to work on education for sustainable development during early childhood. This approach is based on several pillars, the environmental, the social, the economic pillar, the cultural pillar. All demands the construction of values and citizenship. And this task starts uh, already in early childhood education. Most of the values are learned by living them, especially during early childhood. Therefore, every single person working in the preschools or with children should promote respect for the inviolability of human life, individual freedom and integrity, the equal value of all the people, equality between women and men, girls and boys, and solidarity 
between people. No child in the preschool should be subjected to discrimination on the grounds of gender, et ethnic, origin, religion, or their belief, disabilities of the or age, or any person with whom the child is associated or to any other abusive treatment. Early childhood education should be undertaken in democratic forms and lay the foundation for a growing interest and responsibility among children for active participation in civic life and for sustainable development, not only economic, but also social and environmental. Early childhood education policies and curriculum can point out how values and knowledge should be both the content of communication between teachers and children, adults and children, children between them, as well as the base of pedagogy to guide daily life in preschool and at home, protecting and fulfilling children's human rights. In order to conclude this brief presentation and to give the floor to my two colleagues, I would like to close emphasizing that there is a need for transformation in order to change unsustainable ways of thinking, doing, and living, and for the new models of action supported by ethics. For this reason, it would be necessary to develop a critical, disruptive, and transformative perspective inside educational policies and pedagogy for early childhood education and care based on solid framework of humanitarian values and on human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mercedes, for uh, your sessions. Of such an insightful sessions from Mercedes, we uh, could learn that transformation is needed to achieve inclusive and quality education as a part of sustainability development, because uh, they are the key, you know, to future generations, especially in early childhood. Uh, promoting tolerance, unity, diversity, and humanitarian values. Uh, in order to achieve a new paradigm of society that implement humanitarian values because it is crucial to put those virtues on pedagogics because it is the basic for character building that will stay uh, for a children's entire life. So it is very important and uh, it's getting more and more interesting. And now we would like to welcome our second speaker for today. Ms. Jessica and Esri PhD as the OMEP representative in the United Nations. Jessica and Esri PhD is an associate professor of education and the inclusive education program director at Casenovia College. As an international teacher educator, Dr. Esri was an expat for several years in Dubai and has presented at OMEP conferences in many countries, including Prague, Shanghai, and Panama. Prior to higher education, Jess taught first and fourth grade in a community with a high pover poverty rate and was a lead teacher in the SUNY UB Early Childhood Research Center. Dr. Esri is currently a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Formative Design in Learning and the author of many early childhood education publications. She is OMEP representative in the United Nations HQ and the member of the NGO Committee on Migration. We would like to once again announce to all of our audiences, if you have any questions, you could address it to our email at hello at, at heroes.asia and we will upload the answers on social media. And now, Ms. Jessica, the floor is yours. Hello, friends around the world. Thank you for being here. 
today. I'm very privileged to join you and I thank our partners at Heroes for the at Heroes movement for inviting us to participate. I represent the World Organization for Early Childhood Education and my name is Dr. Jessica Esri, Associate Professor of Education and the Program Director of Inclusive Education at Casnovia College, also the United Nations Representative for OMEP. Um, today, I have a great privilege of talking with you about a topic that is near and dear, defining humanitarian values for civic engagement in early childhood care and education. <clears throat> humanitarian values. Um, first, we're going to start with an overall theoretical framework. So what are we talking about when we talk about advocacy versus apathy. Um, in order to discuss how we support humanitarian values, we really have to know the difference between advocacy and apathy. Um, and so I'll leave you with an example that I experienced in a first grade classroom. I was in this first grade classroom and um, a young girl was learning about deforestation for the first time. And she participated in uh, watching a video about deforestation with images similar to the one I credit the US Forest Service for here in the slide. Um, animals, families losing their homes due to rapid deforestation or just being pushed out due to low air quality, what have you. Um, this is an extreme event. It's it happening around the world. And she felt helpless in that moment because at the end of the lesson, Simply, she was asked to put words and sort them into two different columns according to a learning objective for that day's vocabulary activity. And all the words had to do with deforestation. This made her feel a sense of learned helplessness. Um, there was a lack of civic involvement in that activity. And we never want children to feel this way in their education. We want them to feel that they're agents in society and that their voice matters. Um, that can simply change by asking the children to write a letter to a company that's involved in deforestation to share their feelings and thoughts on the topic. Um, all of a sudden, a lesson which has the same learning outcomes to improve that vocabulary development, same academic outcomes, but then it has a civic component as well. So we can embed these lessons. Um, otherwise, we run the risk of teaching apathy, and it's a hidden curriculum, and there's such a danger in that. So apathy is, in general, a lack of involvement with taking on different issues, uh, and could be for a variety of reasons that uh, people feel apathetic towards things. But um, I would argue that this apathy that we see sometimes, uh, lacking humanitarian value or interest, engagement, um, starts in the early childhood years. So as adults, we try to support uh, ultimately civic engagement and supporting our children as civic agents from birth. After all, a baby can offer a smile and this is even a form of giving to others. So it's not something that should start at a certain readiness point. It's something that they should start from the womb. This helps them avoid civic helplessness. Um, we don't have a ton of research linking this to depression amongst young children, but it would be a question. Um, and I, I pose it to you. When children have a lack of civic engagement and they feel a sense of civic helplessness, as in they care about the topic, but they don't see how they can influence the topic within their current sphere, um, could we be uh, creating some of the depressive things that we see happening um, and conditions that has yet to be fully explored in the literature. But a lack of civic involvement due to a culture of apathy definitely um, runs these children at risk of, of being apathetic towards civic engagement in their future. Now, volunteerism and civic engagement are different. And the sense of volunteerism can just be simple episodes of volunteering. Uh, slacktivism is a new term used by the United Nations to talk about posting and reposting on social media. Um, and it can be a wonderful volunteerist act, um, but it's not necessarily civic engagement. And we'll talk about why in, the, in a moment. And then there's service learning where you might do something 
um, and connect it with what your prior knowledge was, but then you don't go out and lead efforts perhaps in the future. So an example of volunteering would be to plant a tree in your yard when, once you learn about deforestation. And then uh, one level further would be to plant a tree and then learn about deforestation somewhere or perhaps send a tree to that area. That's where we start to touch upon service learning. But when we're really reaching a level of civic engagement, we're talking about thorough ongoing civic efforts that a person can take on and that they have the ability to self-initiate um, as well as to collaboratively, collaboratively support. So it's a matter of activism, which we talked about in the volunteerism examples, as well as uh, advocacy in combination. We understand that even though someone is involved in volunteerism and civic engagement, the consequences of their actions aren't necessarily just going to be great, even though they're civic agents and we want to try to, to develop their abilities to contribute to society, they may help, they may have unintended consequences, um, or there may be no help at all. Uh, for example, when some solar cookers were donated to a village in, um, in Tanzania, the consequence was that these solar cookers privileged some lives and then the other lives remain the same. So some people were still collecting kindling while other people were able to benefit from the solar cookers. So even though it was an act of civic engagement, it ended up dividing the village socially and it created a lot of uh, conflict actually. So uh, we have to be very thoughtful. We cannot just dive in uh, always and we need guides that really understand how to best operate in a way that supports um, the, the culture and context, working within the emic and etic perspectives, both insider knowledge and those who can see it from an outside perspective. So what is this literature on early childhood care and education in terms of how we work with our young civic individuals? Um, well, there's the notion of emergent civic engagement, that young children are not simply passive actor, actors, they may offer their opinions, time, materials, actions, and emotions to society, and that media literature and other primary data evidence suggests that young children have diverse abilities in civically engaging with society at a young age. Um, I talk with my uh, young children about my presentations. I am able to put them into words that they can comprehend. And then from there, they give me advice on my presentations uh, as well. So even a presentation like this, I can break it down, speak and get advice back from my young children. And this simple act gives them a voice in society as I am a civic agent and share my sphere of influence with them. Now there are diverse uh, civic foundations because not all of us were raised in the same way to be civic agents. So children learn lessons about civic engagement from their environment. Um, findings from secondary data, including personal reflections on childhood civic engagement experiences that were collected from five um, ECCE experts suggest that this exists. So well, what we basically did is, um, I, as a researcher myself, a researcher from Russia, from South Korea, Turkey, and Tanzania, we discussed our early childhood civic uh, events. And then we talked about how this provided a foundation for our future civic engagement. Um, and we shared those examples in our research. And if all of these things exist within different nations, subcultures, and families around the world. So we can shape um, how much a civic uh, opportunity young children have within our society. Uh, and that was very clear through this research. So we must take a moment, um, and I, I give photo credit uh, to Alicio de Amaco, um, Amico, I'm sorry, for this wonderful sculpture of nonviolence. And it was gifted from Luxembourg to the United Nations, the permanent mission of Luxembourg. And, um, and this is really the idea behind the pacifist philosophy. And the pacifist philosophy is one in which civic engagement is used to support peaceful solutions to problems. Um, the viewpoint is that all violence is unjustifiable. But as you can see, that doesn't mean nothing is done. It simply means that there have to be peaceable um, ways to go about doing so. 
So we have the, the image of this gun to remind us right outside of the United Nations in its crumpled fashion. So this keynote request um, came and the request was to address these terms, which are commonly, they commonly represent um, humanitarian values. So today I'll take a, an, um, a crack at that and give that an attempt. Um, but I'm gonna do it in light of many things. Uh, before we move forward with those terms, I want to recognize that, uh, of course, in our pacifist way, we, we have this responsibility to uphold human rights and to offer rapid action in times of crisis. Um, examples of group responses to address war crimes on an international level, the International Criminal Court and the UN Security Council are two groups. And when my um, young son asked me about the events happening, um, the current events and comments are made, well, what will happen, Mama? Who's going to take away their toys until they make good choices? We can also use common language that children understand to discuss these current events. How would you feel if somebody came to your classroom and uh, took over your classroom? What would you do to peacefully solve that problem? Um, so we use these spaces. Of course, it, fear can really come in if we're using the home as a space. So using parks and classrooms and other examples to help them relate to problems that are happening internationally um, can help us engage in these conversations around these key words, unity, universality, neutrality, independence, humility, impartiality, and voluntary service. So the thesis of this presentation is that although, you know, sometimes adults tend to defer responsibility for civic engagement, uh, for example, I am uh, I have a health issue and then we see this young child constructing, you know, very sick and making teddy bears for other sick children because that cheered one child up. Um, I am going to retire and therefore I'm going to slow down all these sometimes we we see adults refer defer responsibility for civic engagement and this limits the sphere of influence in each young child's life as well. So the young child, young children look to the adults to have these agenda, uh, an ongoing agenda for civic engagement despite any life circumstance. So we can't really defer responsibility. And of course, there's some direct ways that we can see evidence of individuals deferring responsibility, like whispering criticism or just, you know, um, and then, then there's some indirect ways as well. So it has to be self-initiated. It has to be an agenda. There's a sense, um, sometimes there's false representations, uh, images of civic engagement, but less in action. So uh, what's really happening? Well, we have these wonderful humanitarian terms and they involve these humanitarian values and we must not use these to justify any apathetic behavior. So how might we use positive perspectives of civic engagement in order to further define these terms? That's that's a big marching order, but it's, it can be done. So first of all, we have to think of avoiding colonialism and civic engagement. Uh, the fixed, there's the notions of the fixed versus the fluid. So we need to maintain a fluid understanding of these terms. Uh, a common perception is that terms are defined in dictionaries and have to be utilized according to the definition. But I would offer you the rebuttal today that a dictionary is a living document. We see hundreds of words added to the dictionary uh, many different types of dictionaries often. So to be a civic engagement, we have to define and redefine, aggregate and disaggregate concepts to clarify these common humanitarian terms to better align with the values. So in summary, civic engagement behaviors and humanitarian values may be influenced by miseducation. And this is something we have to watch out for. It's the hidden curriculum. It can be found in images and behaviors in the classroom. It can be found in words that are uh, not interpreted well. It can be found in overgeneralizations in our words. So any apathetic cultural norms, language trends, which dissuade social responsibility and support exclusion, socioeconomic capital considerations, and individual ego can, can move against a tide that we really want to be supporting. And, and that is um, that we are all part of this world and we need to civically engage. 
So adult words and actions can be used to civically engage young children, inclusive efforts or otherwise. And we see this in uh, this the article that's referenced here is work to engage um, in children and sympathy. And sympathy is a new concept around uh, and coined in this article around engaging children in uh, socio-scientific issues to problems. And we've actually found uh, through reviewing that literature that children with diverse technically identified needs of various sorts are able to participate in these wonderful science lessons when because everyone has a stake in the socio-scientific issues that are that exist in this world and then it's exciting to think that the civic engagement in early childhood education is a topic which warrants further investigation because if we create a foundation it becomes a life habit um, and if you think back to your own civic engagement experiences in early childhood, how did those experiences influence the civic agent you are today? How did your, your family stories influence the civic agent you've become? Um, and so we think about this, the other institutions in a child's life and their influence. Um, and as we carefully, most fluidly use these words to support our civic work and teaching beyond the definitions. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you today. Um, it's been, or tonight, where, wherever you might be, uh, it's been an honor. And I, uh, I very fondly look forward to your feedback on this. And I, I do hope that you are able to write to me um, and I look forward to getting to know you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica, for your session, such a fruitful and insightful session. Uh, we could learn that all violence is unacceptable. Humanitarian terms involve humanitarian values and it must not be used to justify a pathetic behavior. Uh, it might influence by miseducation, you know, a pathetic behavior, uh, social norms and language trends until individual ego, because we need to introduce civil engagement in early childhood education. So it could become a life habit that transform the whole society. And it could lead to a better, better society where humanitarian values uh, become the core of our day-to-day -day basis. And now ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome our third speaker for today. Ms. Mie Oba as the OMEP Japan representative. Ms. Mie Oba is a professor at the Faculty of Educational Sciences of the Municipal University of Fukuyama in Hiroshima Prefecture. She trains kindergarten and primary school teachers. She won the Global ESD Award 2019, 10th Annual Education for Sustainable Development Prize Competition by the World Organization for Early Childhood Education or OMEP for her project, Peace Education for Young Children and Early Childhood Teachers, inspiring a peaceful mind using an effective learning resource. And she is also an active member of OMEP Japan. And we would like to once again announce to all of our audiences today, if you have any questions and suggestions or uh, any ideas that you would like to share to us, you could address it to our email at hello at, at heroes.asia and we will upload the answers on our social media platforms. And without any further ado, Ms. Mie, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am Mie Oba of OMEP Japan, professor of Fukuyama City University. I live in Fukuyama City in Hiroshima Prefecture. I'm very pleased and honored to present our activities. This photo presents the children's work using paper crane. Here are the contents of my presentation. First, I would like to present the system of ECCE in Japan. Next, Fukuyama City description. Third topic is peace culture in Hiroshima prefecture. Final topic, it is a story around rose flowers. 
This diagram shows the structure of ECCE in Japan. Before entering to elementary school, facilities of ECCE is divided into three. Nursery schools for zero to five years old children, integrated center for ECCE for zero to five years old children, and kindergarten for three to five years old children. Between nursery school and integrated center for ECCE, they have common contents of three domains for zero years old and five domains for one to three years old. For three to five years old, nursery school, integrated center for ECC, and kindergarten have the common contents of five domains. This is the contents of zero years. Contents of ECC of one to five years old have these five domains. They are undifferentiated through playing, through surroundings. Children get harmonized learning and cross curricular competencies. Considering the continuous development from the birth, child develop as an active and interactive individual. Let me show the city of Fukuyama. Fukuyama is the second largest city in Hiroshima prefecture, 200 east of Hiroshima city. Fukuyama Castle is founded in 1622, so 2022 is the 400th anniversary. In 1945, 80% of city was burned out by air lead. The present castle was reconstructed after the war. People began to reconstruct their city after war damage. Traditionally, it has long been believed that holding thousands of paper cranes will make a wish come true. But today, they are known as a symbol of peace in Japan. This connection between paper crane and peace can be traced back to a young girl Sadako Sasaki, who died of leukemia 10 years after the atomic bombing in Hiroshima. Believing that holding paper cranes would help her recover, she kept holding, holding them to the end. But she passed away. The Children's Peace Monument that stands in Hiroshima Peace Park was built expressing the dream of a peaceful future for children. Now, 10 million cranes are sent from all over the world. At Fukuyama City, since 1991, as a peace appeal exhibition, the works of children with a hope of peace, such as the posters and strings of a thousand paper cranes are displayed in every summer. This is the structure of peace education in the curriculum of nursery school in Fukuyama from 2008 to 2018. I would like to start five years old children. They discuss the importance of peace and irreplaceable life reading picture books, listening experience war time, tasting war time food, singing song for peace, visiting to the museum of peace, sharing about their understanding of peace in daily life. Every summer, children make co-production using paper cranes together. 
four years old children participate in the call production for peace. They begin to discuss and share about peace in daily life. Three years old children watch the activities of senior children and listen to peace song. They talk and feel peace in daily life. Zero to two years old children feel the activities of senior children for peace, watching, listening, and touching. The peace education for young children in Fukuyama structured according to children's development. Children grow up feeling the culture of peace in daily life rather than be taught in be taught be taught it. Excuse me. In 2018, the curriculum of nursery school and kindergarten in Fukuyama was revised. In the draft, the part about the peace education was disappearing. Veteran teachers and I, we insisted the importance of peace education in early childhood. This is the tradition of Ishishi in Fukuyama, and it is necessary for young nursery teachers. Peace education is an important teacher's training. As a result, one sentence was left about peace in the part of five years children. But practices about peace is continuing in nursery schools now. In July and August, they talk about a bomb, Hiroshima, air attack to Fukuyama, a bomb, Nagasaki, and end of war. Unfortunately, visit to Museum of Peace is suspended since 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Three to four years old children participate in activities for peace with five years old children. Zero to two years old children watch, listen to, touch, and feel the activities of senior children. Let me explain three steps of developing peace of mind in children and students. First step is Kamishibai. This Kamishibai is a real story of a tree exposed to the effects of the A bomb in Hiroshima. This Kamishibai is made with a survivor of A bomb Hiroshima. Second step is physical expression with a song. Seeds of peace were sown, they, sprout, they sprouted, flower bloomed, and they grew peace trees. You can see a lot of peace trees. Third step is holding paper cranes, wishing peace by making paper cranes with friends. When children were holding paper cranes, they said, we are friends. I'm happy to make paper cranes with my friends. My friends is kind to help me. They understand the friendship, kindness, cooperation, and attachment are important. Warm feeling is one of the children's image of peace. This activity won the ESD Award 2019 from World OMEP. The survivor who made with us this Kamishibai of the story in Hiroshima was very, very delighted at this news. And she said to me, please continue. Peace all of the world is my wish. But she finished a life of 92 years old in 2020. Our activities for peace with children and students is continued. 
In 2020, World OMEP presented three movies of our peace activities with children in Fukuyama by official Facebook. I would like to invite you to discover the Japanese culture of peace watching these short movies. I presented our peace education effort for early childhood using Kamshiva at the presentation of the World OMEP's ESD Award. 2019. Our activities have become well, well known around the world. And my friends in Sweden load our, our efforts as chapter 14, Peace Education. In the book of Preschool Education for Sustainability in Sweden. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, my students could not visit to nursery school for the activities of peace education. So we tried to explore a different way of practice to learn the culture of peace in no contact situation. We made a movie to explain the process of holding a paper crane using a large paper to children accompanied with singing a song, Paper Crane. I'm sorry, but I can't show you the movies. But in Fukuyama, five years old children can hold it by themselves. This was an effective training for future teachers of ECC. Please try folding paper cranes, you can do it. I went to the uh, public nursery school to show this movie with an with an authorization as the pandemic continued. After watching the movie, four years old boys said to me, we want to make a paper crane with a large paper like this. I discussed about the activity of making a large paper crane with the director of this public school, public nursery school and the municipal office. Finally, we realized the visit in July 2021. Children listened to a story of Hiroshima by Kamishibai and enjoyed expressing development of peace, peace tree with a song. Four five years old children attained their purpose to hold a large paper crane with help of students. Now, mother and baby paper crane as co-production of children and teachers and a giant crane that children made with my students. Welcome all children, families, and visitors at the entrance of this public nursery school in Fukuyama. It's August 2021. Children and nursery teachers made a paper crane this is a paper crane continue to inspire peaceful mind at nursery school. This is children's production using different paper cranes after our visit. It was presented in Peace Appeal Exhibition 2021. Tree, sky, animals, insects, and friends. They live in the peaceful world and the image of children. It shows us the sensibility of humanity. Now, I talk about the second topic, wash from the start. This activity is developed by collaboration of OMEP and UNICEF, as you know. Wash with peace. Let's return to the history of Fukuyama City on the, on the 8th August 1945, air led by US bombers destroyed and burned 80% of the city, including the Fukuyama castle. There are many victims. After the end of war, 
to encourage each other, people planted roses. This is the reason that the rose is a symbol of reconstruction and peace in Fukuyama. But unfortunately, the, oh, excuse me, rose festival in May is held every year since 1968. But unfortunately, the rose festival in 2020 and 2021 were canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We lost the opportunity to admire the lost flower. But local community members were not disappointed. We can use our losses for children in this difficult time. They created handmade soaps from lost flowers and they provided over 100 soaps to integrated centers for ECCE. Children wash hands using this rose soap, feeling the kindness of local community to try and encourage children and teachers. In 2021, they continue providing the rose soaps. I was a chairman of the a uh, 31st National Congress of the Japanese Society for Education of Young Children. The theme of this Congress was Peace for Children. It was a valuable opportunity to think about peace for children in daily life. Considering the current situation in Ukraine, we feel it was meaningful to hold a Congress on this theme of peace last December. And we, adults, have to consider and take action to protect peace as a human right of children. We continue our challenges for peace of all children in the world. I hope you understand our activities for peace of children Let's keep a cooperation and solidarity for the well being and the rights of children. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mie, for such an insightful session. Uh, from if uh, you allow me to recap uh, a little bit from our previous sessions uh, with Mercedes and Jessica. We learned about the concept and fundamental values, as well as the importance of teaching humanitarian values. And from Mie, we could learn about the actual implementation of learning the culture of peace in early childhood education. The teacher uh, teach about the war and how does it impact everybody's life. And the most important thing to teach the children is how to rise from the situation by a lot of methods. For example, Kamishibai, uh, where teachers teach about the concept of peace by, uh, by using creativity, making crafts such as paper cranes, artworks through books, pictures, and technology. So it is a comprehensive way you know, to learning methods and to introduce the concept of peace to the students. And uh, we would like to uh, once again announce to all of our audiences, uh, if you have any questions, uh, suggestions, or maybe some ideas, you could address it to our email at hello at, at heroes.asia, and we will upload the answers on social media. You could also find the email address uh, on the uh, chat column down below. And before we end the session for today, we would like to take pictures uh, with all of our audiences as well as the speakers. So if everybody could uh, kindly please open uh, your camera and you know, uh, just uh, pose and smile a little bit on my count. So um, let me see everybody show your best smiles wherever you are because uh, wherever you are, whatever you do right now, uh, we would like to appreciate and thank you very, very much for making the time for today. And we do really hope that uh, the sessions uh, 
uh, could have a good value uh, for your implementations and also important contributions. And okay, everybody seems on right now. So on my count, uh, put on your best smile. So uh, in three, two, one, smile to the camera, everyone. Okay, hold on for a bit. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, everybody. And from all of our speakers, let me conclude the sessions that we could see that it is crucial to teach the concept of uh, peace and humanitarian value, uh, such as humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, voluntary services, unity, as well as universality, because it could shape the mentality and personality of a child. And that affects a lot of things, such as character, way of thinking, and their values of life. If we educate a child, it means we help to shape a future generations and to wider perspective, a face of a nation. Imagine how beautiful and powerful our world would be if we have future generations who is critical, but also have a good character and good moral values. It would be really, really great environment that we could all uh, probably imagine. And thank you very much everyone for making the time uh, to be with us uh, from wherever you are. I saw previously it was from Greece, from New York, from Sweden, France. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I couldn't mention one by one. And that's a wrap for today. Thank you very much for watching the forum. We do really hope that it could be a useful addition of everybody's knowledge and for a good implementation. I'm Farhani Sanasution signing out. See you in another forum. Ciao, everyone. Good morning, good evening, and also good afternoon. Thank you.